the Information Security Forum's standards of good practice for information security divides system management into two main areas, system configuration and system maintenance. Each area is further divided into four topics. With respect to security, the objective of system configuration is to develop and enforce consistent system configuration policies that can cope with current and protected workloads, and also protect systems and the information they process and store against malfunction, cyber attack, unauthorized disclosure, and loss. The objective of system maintenance is to provide guidance for the system security management by performing backups for crucial information and software, applying a rigorous change management process, and monitoring the performance against agreed-upon service level agreements. Let's start this discussion with server configuration. A server is the core of any enterprise IT facility. It hosts shared applications, shared data, and other shared resources. It provides a wide variety of services to internal and external users. Many servers also store or process sensitive information for the organization. Some of the most common types of servers are application servers, web servers, email servers, database servers, infrastructure management servers, and file servers. Let's watch a video together to understand server better. What is a server? So that is the topic of this video. Now a server is basically a dedicated computer that provides services on behalf of clients, such as ordinary desktop computers or workstations. So it's a centralized machine where multiple clients connect to either over the internet or in a local area network, and they connect to a server for a specific service. So for example, that service could be to retrieve a website, to access data or email and so on. Now a server could be dedicated to handle one of these services only, where you would have one server dedicated for a website, one server for data storage, and a server for email. And this model is what larger organizations use. Or you can also set up a server to handle each of these services on the same machine, which is what typically happens in smaller organizations. So depending upon which setup is used, it all depends on the needs of an organization. Server configuration needs to consider the range of threats to server security that are possible or at least likely to exist. The National Institute of Standard and Technology Special Publication provides several common security threats to servers. Malicious entities can exploit software bugs in the server and its underlying components to gain unauthorized access to the server. Denial of service attacks can be directed to the server and its supporting network infrastructure to deny and hinder valid users from making use of the service. Sensitive information on the server can be read by unauthorized individuals or changed in an unauthorized manner. Unencrypted or weakly encrypted sensitive information can be intercepted during the transmission between the server and the client. Malicious entities, through a successful attack on the server, can gain unauthorized access to the resources elsewhere in the organization's network. Malicious entities can attack other entities after compromising a server. These attacks can be launched directly or indirectly. For many organizations, the majority of such attacks are internal, in other words, from within the organization. To help organizations with server configuration, the SANS Institute provides a policy document template. The template defines some general requirements for the server security, as well as some specific configuration requirements. According to the SANS Institute, an organization should impose several general requirements for the server security. First of all, all internal servers deployed at the organization must be owned by an operational group that is responsible for system and server administration, including virtual servers. Approved server configuration guides must be established and maintained by each operational group based on business needs. Also, guides should be approved by Chief Information Security Officer. Operational groups should monitor configuration compliance and implement an exception policy tailored to their environment. Also, each operational group must establish a process for changing the configuration guides, which includes review and approval by the Chief Information Security Officer. 
In particular, servers must be registered within the enterprise management system. In addition, information in the enterprise management system must be kept up to date. Finally, configuration changes and production servers must follow the appropriate change management procedures. The Sense Institute's template also provides several specific configuration requirements as well. The operation system configuration should be in accordance with the approved security guidelines. Also, services and applications that are not in use anymore must be disabled. Access to services should be locked or protected through access control methods, such as a web application firewall. Furthermore, the most recent security patches must be installed on the system. The only exception is when an application immediately interferes with the business requirements. The trust relationships between systems are a security risk, therefore their use should be avoided. Also, it should always use the standard security principle of least required access to perform a function. If a methodology for a secure channel connection is available, perform privileged access over secure channels. Also, servers should be physically located in an access-controlled environment. Next, we are going to introduce virtual servers. To understand virtual servers, we need to understand virtualization. Virtualization is a technology that provides an abstraction of the computing resources used by some software that runs in a simulated environment called a virtual machine. It provides better efficiency by supporting for multiple operating systems and associated applications on one physical system. The following video will help you understand the concept of virtualization. When you hear the term virtualization, you might think about wearing a VR helmet and playing games, or Keanu Reeves fighting bad guys in the Matrix. But in the IT world, virtualization has revolutionized the way we think about data and where it lives, moving us closer to a completely on-demand data world. To quote Keanu, whoa. Virtualization is the act of making something appear real when in reality it doesn't exist. In the world of computers, a virtual machine is created when software separates the operating system and its applications from the physical computer hardware. This software process is called a hypervisor. The hypervisor then lets a physical host machine operate multiple virtual machines as guests, sharing computing resources such as memory, network bandwidth, and CPU cycles. A big benefit is that one piece of hardware can now run applications on different operating systems, which once required different physical computers. For example, one physical server can now run a Windows app that needs some memory, while at the same time a Linux app can use the leftover memory for its own purposes. One machine instead of many, multiplied by hundreds or thousands of other machines and apps. In addition, if one particular application or virtual machine falls prey to an error, system crash, or virus attack, other virtual machines on the same device will still operate just fine. Virtualization has saved companies a lot of money in hardware costs and physical location costs. A company's data center that once housed hundreds of large machines can be significantly reduced through virtualization. As virtualization became more popular, other areas of the IT landscape became virtualized. Desktop, network, application, and storage virtualization have grown in popularity in recent years. Computers and computing used to be at the core of IT, but now it's about the information and making that data available anytime and anywhere. Virtualization is the key driver in realizing this on-demand data world. And that, my friends, is much cooler than fighting agents in the matrix. A hypervisor is software that sits between hardware and virtual machines. It acts as a resource broker. It allows multiple virtual machines to safely coexist on a, sing on a single physical server and share their server's resources. The virtualizing software provides abstraction of all physical resources and enable multiple computing stacks to be run on a single physical server. There is a list on this slide that's the summary of functions performed by a hypervisor. So there are two types of hypervisors distinguished by whether there is an operating system between the hypervisor and the host. A type 1 hypervisor is loaded as a software layer directly on a physical server, much as an operating system is loaded. It is referred to as native virtualization. A type 2 hypervisor exploits the resources and functions of a host operating system and runs as a software module on the top of the, that operating system. It relies on the operating system to handle all hardware interactions on the hypervisor's behalf. 
The type 2 hypervisor is referred to as the hosted virtualization or nested virtualization. A relatively recent approach to virtualization is container virtualization or application virtualization. In this approach, the software known as virtualization container runs on top of the host operating system kernel and provides an isolated execution environment for applications. The use of virtualized systems leads to a number of security concerns and the existing literature provides a list of virtualization security issues. First of all, it is important to confirm that programs executing within a guest operating system can only access and use the resources that are allocated to it. It is also important to confirm that the guest operating system cannot covertly interact with the programs or data in the guest operating systems or in the hypervisor. A hypervisor has privileged access to programs and data in, guest, in the guest operating systems. So the hypervisor must be trusted as secure from subversion and compromised use of access. Finally, it is important to ensure security of the environment. It is particularly important to have a proper management of images and snapshots since attackers can attempt to view or modify. The National Institute of Standard and Technology Special Publication provides guidance for the appropriate security in virtualized systems. It states that organizations using virtualization should do the following. First, plan the security of the virtualized system carefully. Second, secure all elements of a full virtualization solution, including the hypervisor, guest operating systems, and virtualized infrastructure, and also maintain their security. Third, ensure that the hypervisor is properly secured. Finally, restrict and protect administrator access to the virtualization solution. It is also important to secure the hypervisor by using a process similar to the one securing an operating system. In other words, install the hypervisor in an isolated environment and update it to the latest patches in order to minimize the number of vulnerabilities. In addition, an organization should perform the following activities here listed on this slide. Virtualized systems manage access to hardware resources such as disk storage and network interfaces. Its access must be limited to just the appropriate guest operating systems. Also, access to virtual machine images and snapshots must be carefully controlled because these are another potential point of attack. A hosted virtualized system, as typically used on client systems, poses some additional security concerns. These concerns result from the presence of the host operating system under the hypervisor and its guest operating systems. Therefore, there are more layers to be secured and managed. It is also possible to design a host system and a virtualization solution that is more protected from the access and modification by its users. The approach can be used to support well-secured guest operating system images that provide access to the enterprise network and data. It can also be used to support central administration and update of these images.